Thanks for watching our videos here in the Adrain Museum Network. If you love them, and we know you do, right, Jay? Yeah. Subscribe. Do it right now. Hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified when we post great new content, including content with Jay and me. Thanks. Welcome back to our exhibition here at the Adrain Automobile Museum, Early Landmarks of Automotive Engineering. And for this section, we're actually not talking about automobiles. And to do that, we're going to talk about motorcycles with Jay Leno. How are you? Good to see you. Yeah, this is a very exciting motorcycle here. This is a Pierce built in Buffalo, New York. You know, we don't think of Buffalo, New York as being an industrial place right now. Mm. But at the turn of the century, there were more millionaires per capita in Buffalo than anywhere because of the timber barons, all those people who live up there, because the cool weather was an advantage for workers, especially during the summer. Exactly. And it was easier to keep a plant warm than it was to keep it cool. So a lot of manufacturing in the Erie Canal and all of that. And Pierce really was quite a company. This is a, a four-cylinder motorcycle, 1904. And this is the first American four-cylinder, correct? I believe so, I believe so. Has a lot of innovative ideas. You know, now when you ride a motorcycle, they insulate the engine, you know. This is a case of insulating the rider. There's no shock absorber. I'll tell you why this is uh, restored correctly, because this is something everybody forgets. Most people put hand grips on. What these are, the idea with this motorcycle, you would go down the road, and as you picked up speed the road got bumpy, you put your hands back here, and this would take the shock Aha. out of your shoulder. So you, if you're here like this, you're you transmitting know, you, all the shock yeah, through your body. In your body, but see, this is just, the handlebar ends here, and this is just pure rubber like a shock about. So you slip your hands back, and then, and then you, ah. just, you just do it like, but it, it works. I Brilliant. Mean, when you ride one of these, it's really quite comfortable. And it was smooth, and you really probably never went much more than 20 or 20, there were no roads. Multi-cylinders give smoothness over a single or a twin, right. so it seems sort of obvious that you would go to uh, a four-cylinder. Well, also easier to start uh -huh. because you have four times the chance of getting a spark than you did with... I mean, most of these, you just drop your foot and, thump, thump, and it w compression was low, so you had four spark. Any one of them would hit and then keep the whole thing going. So, yeah, it was, it, they, they were quite good, actually. Pretty amazing. I mean, extremely well made, and the idea of integrating the tank into the frame, quite clever. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it really is a unique piece. Uh, you know, Pierce built bird cages. They built automobiles. I mean, the Pierce Hour was one of the three P's. Exactly. It, Pierce, the Packard, yeah, and, and Pierce. Yeah, and I would take a, a uh, Pierce Hour 66 over a Rolls Royce any day. Hmm. To this day, it still has the biggest engine of any vehicle. It's uh, 845 cubic inches, a six, with three uh, spark plugs per cylinder. But these motorcycles were quite outstanding and quite expensive. This was really something for the guy that had a lot of money. I mean, the, I'm not sure, I can't remember what, what the cost would be now, but certainly it would be, if a regular motorcycle is $10,000, this would probably be thirty dollars or $40,000. It's also interesting as the parallels between automotive development at the turn of the century and motorcycle development because you had these extremes in ranges, but you really saw the difference in an inexpensive versus a more expensive in terms of technology and things like that. In fact, right, you're getting right. this four-cylinder motorcycle with these great features like the integrated uh, oil and, and fuel tanks and all that, which you would not see in a less expensive. It's funny how it went because motorcycles and cars, motorcycles are a little faster, more power, then cars came in. And then during the 50s and 60s, it was Triumphs and Harleys, and, but they really weren't, they were quick, but not fast. Mm -hmm. Cars were faster. Nowadays, you can get a Ducati with 225 horsepower, blows the doors off Bugattis and all these other vehicles, you know, so, so the motorcycle technology has really surpassed it. But uh, for a while there, in the 30s, it really wasn't ahead. You know, it kind of fell behind. They just got built dependable flathead bikes, the big Indians, you know, the, and then when the Japanese came along, that's when the technology really began to move in the late 50s and 60s. Well, Jay, let's take a look at another motorcycle in this exhibition to see perhaps why the four-cylinder fell out of favor in favor of twins, which doesn't make any sense to me, but let's take a look at that. The Great War has come and gone, and now we're on the other side, and it's really interesting looking at this 1924 Harley-Davidson. 
that the technology advances that happened with cars during World War I, basically because of the development in tank engines and airplane engines, mm -hmm. seems to have put motorcycles in reverse because we had that Pierce 4 in 1910. Now here in 1924, the king of the road are twins. Well, yes and no. I mean, what sounds better, a 22 or a big shotgun? Do you know what I'm saying? Whereas these had a powerful, you got a lot of torque, you got a, low end, a lot of low-end power with these. Uh, Multi-cylinder bikes, you had to rev it a little bit. And look how much longer the Pierce is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a long wheelbase, so it got more sophisticated. People went around corners more, you know? Uh, in the old days, just to get on a motorcycle and go down the road. Well, that was... That was the triumph. Yeah, and it was smooth, and that was fine. And then suddenly you want to go around corners and make it handle. And the, the twin was perfect for that. They, they, you, you could balance out the vibrations, and it sounded cooler. You kicked it, it was <laughs> I mean, it made a real bang sound. I mean, it really sounded that famous Harley that used to say, potato, 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 you know. <laughs> that, 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 yeah, so, uh, I mean, that's one aspect of it. Um, what do you think the, uh, the effect on the use of these as army motorcycles, I mean, as, as everybody knows, the First World War was the first mechanized war, so right. you had motorcycles as a part of the combat array. And you realize, before World War I, armies could travel no faster than 4.8 miles per hour, because you marched. To get across Europe, 4.8 miles, well, how long would that take you? It would take you months. months. And then suddenly, oh my God, you, you're moving people, it seem, almost seems like with the speed of light, you could get hundreds of people to the next battleground within hours, you know. And the same thing with this. I mean, this is pretty advanced. Now, you say it's, it, it's a step back, but this has overhead valves. Mm -hmm. And you can see in the gas tank here, there's a cutaway, so the push rod doesn't hit the, the tank. I mean, it looks high tech for, for what it was. Um, there's no clutch on that. Mm -hmm. This, you can shift gears. You have a, fl a foot clutch. Um, it's a pretty sophisticated vehicle and, and quite comfortable and quite reliable. Plus, you know, boring two cylinders is a lot easier than making four. And that's, that's another problem. So ease of manufacturing. And Going away from the, uh, again, as you see in automobiles, the artisan manufacture of a few examples of an object to mass production of an object that you could really turn out and make sure it was reliable in the field right. and all and, of that. And also, unlike England, which did not have cheap automobiles, at least at this point, mm -hmm. Uh, they made small motorcycles at one point to another. In America, you could buy a Model T in 1924 second hand for $10. So you had transportation. So when you built a motorcycle, it was big and powerful and fast. There really weren't a lot of dainty motorcycles just go point A to point B in the 20. Most of them were like that. I mean, they made a few, but everybody wanted a big rip-roaring V-twin because these were really fast. And was it also more directed at sort of practical use in the 1920s, police and, and army and things like that. So people, well, uh, so not for again, sport, people were doing a lot of sport riding well, unless you were a racer. Interesting that you say that, because in England it was more getting point A to point B. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were an English family on a budget, you had a, a single cylinder motorcycle with a sidecar and the whole family would pile into it. In America, motorcycles were still not playthings of the rich, but for roughnecks, mm -hmm. for, you know, guys that you know, go down to the bar, room, room, room. You know, you didn't see people putt, putt, putting along like, oh, this is this is. It'd so be a long time before you could meet the nicest people on a Harley. Well, that's right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and there was a reputation. I mean, these, these made a sound that was sort of frightening and scared women and children, and, you know, they sounded powerful, and, you, vroom, and flames would shoot out the back. I mean, it was, you know, Think how much faster this was. I mean, the Model T had a top speed of 44 miles an mm -hmm. hour, maybe. This could go 75, 80 miles. I mean, it was really, really fast. And even driving one of these today, they're pretty quick. I mean, they're, they're a lot of fun. I mean, Harley was, we don't think of it as uh, advanced now necessarily because they still have. But at this time. But this time they were. Again, overhead valves were, were pretty sophisticated in 1924. So. Yeah, this thing is great. I've this got particular JD. example, uh, which is unrestored, is also a very interesting thing. Now, the speedometer, that was an accessory or was right. that standard? Uh, I, I think a little of both. I mm -hmm. think it was 
uh, I guess some you could get at the dealer. Most people probably didn't. Uh, yeah, I mean, there were all kinds of accessories you could put on these things. I mean, there are a lot of features on this. Let me show you what this is. In cold weather, well, I can't get that gas cap off. But what this is, you pull that up and, and you take a thing of gas, uh, you get a shot of gasoline, you put it in the carburetor. You, ah. you, you, that's what this is. You inject this that is starting. Into, to help you start it, yeah. And these had magnetos. And magnetos, in many ways, were superior to battery and coil, but extremely expensive. expensive. So as soon as motorcycles go over to just a battery and a coil, they did. But when you get a good magneto, you just drop your foot and the, and the thing fires and starts. Yeah, so um, to, to say V-twins were not at advance, in, in some ways they were. They were faster, they were cheaper to manufacture, and they were reasonably smooth, you know? Uh, you could isolate the vibrations like you did on the Pierce as well. Well, we're going to take a look at uh, the last bike in this highlight, which is, again, back to another four. So let's take a look at that. I know that you're looking lustfully at the broth. That's a breast superior. <laughs> But we're going to talk about an Indian. Indian let's go let's there. Let's take a look. Jay, you educated me as to why it was not necessarily a regressive step in technology to go from that 1910 Pierce 4 to the 1924 Harley Twin. And now we're back to a four-cylinder, but one that didn't find a lot of success. Why is that? Well, it's interesting. On a, another note, you see it's called an Indian. And you think in these politically correct times, you know, it's like Chief Wahoo and all that kind of, you, you, you'd think there'd be protests. Mm -hmm. But George Hendy, who, was, who started the company, he was a huge admirer of the American Indian and the culture. And he made sure when he built the bike, he had the top model was the Chief and it was, you know, the full headdress and proud. There was no silliness, you know, woo, yeah. woo none of that kind of nonsense, you know. I mean, so consequently, to this day, there's no controversy over this because, uh, as far as I know, and I might be a little bit wrong on this, but I've never heard any Indian tribes or a, any of the uh, Indian nations uh, say anything about this because it was always with dignity and, and respect. You know, the Indian was the best you could buy and the best of America and all that kind of stuff. So it's just one of those interesting things, you know. How some companies, they have something, you know. Remember Sambo restaurants? Good luck with that. Yeah, that <laughs> didn't last very long. But I because not eating there very much. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. But with this, it was a whole different deal. The other thing was, this costs as much as a car. That was, uh, that was the motorcycle's biggest problem in the early days, where they cost just as much, you know, with, Henry Ford and his assembly line and mechanized uh, the whole deal, uh, you couldn't compete on a cost basis, so you could get a car cheaper. And this was very expensive. And we're thinking, now this is at the height of the Depression as well. It was the height of the Depression. And, and the other thing was, this was good for reliable police work. Four cylinders were never as fast as a twin. So is it a power to weight ratio thing? or? Well, again, these were good for police work. They weren't high-speed bikes, being flatheads, mm -hmm. you know. They were heavy, but they were dependable, easy to start. Again, you just drop your foot with a 4.8 to 1 compression ratio, thump, thump, thump. and it had a lot of low end. Oh, it was mm -hmm. pretty good. You couldn't really rev them. This was, an, this was an attempt with exhaust over inlet to give you a little bit more power, but they just cost too much to make. It really was an economic thing. In the 30s, Nobody had this kind of money for a motorcycle. Motorcycles are still men's toys. toys. You know, it's still the same thing. Men wanted to go fast. Mm -hmm. And you pull up one of these, you pull up in the Harley, vroom, vroom, vroom. the Harley's gonna blow the doors off of this in a race. And that's like today, people like, to, like the fastest, not necessarily the best or the most dependable. I mean, in hindsight, these are just great pieces of Americana. I mean, beautiful engines, they're heavy but they're reliable. I've got a 1944 cylinder with a sidecar. I love that thing. I mean, it's, it's just a lot of fun. But if I was a young man buying a bike, I couldn't afford one of those. Right. You know, it was like a Cadillac versus a Chevy Nova. Well, you get the Chevy Nova with the 396, so you put a big V8, you know, whatever it might be. It was the Cadillac was a big, comfortable. This was sort of the Cadillac of motorcycles, and you couldn't give them away for that price. It is uh, also, I think, a very interesting point, something that I know excites you a great deal, which is technology and technological solutions, which may be successful, may not be successful. They tried to do a lot with this motorcycle in terms of advancements like the exhaust on the top and right. all of that. 
and the fact that it was a four cylinder for smoothness and, and, right. and easy power. But ultimately, it wasn't what the market wanted at the time. Right. And needed at the time. So. And you realize flatheads, people liked them because the oil stayed in the engine. Mm -hmm. They were dependable and they were easy to fix. You could unbolt the head and decarbonize it because gas heads. And yeah, so you had to do that yeah, on a yeah. regular basis. Yeah. Whereas with an overhead valve, you know, I've got a very funny piece of video from a Hudson dealer. They, they would show in the, in, it, it, it was silent with the art card, you mm -hmm. know. And there's an Oldsmobile Rocket 88 and there's a Hudson, and the guy's standing there next to the Rocket 88, and, and the mechanic's going, I'm sorry, Mr. Johnson, but these overhead valves, they're, they're so hard to adjust. Why isn't my car ready? Why can't? Then they pan over to the Hudson dealer, and the guy's just torquing the head, hmm, and the engine's running, and oh, the You're reliable. ready to go, Mr. Lennon. Yeah, th that's right. Uh, so to me, this seemed overly complex. If you were a, a young man, and you did your own work on your motorcycle, this, look, what, what, look at all of this. You know, it just seemed extremely complicated. And this was heavy. This is a lot heavier. You know, if you're a 150 pound guy, this is, this is quite a bit of weight to, to move around. So it was big, it was heavy, it was luxurious, but it was the Cadillac of motorcycles. Well, Jay, I know that when we were standing near the broth, you were looking off with excitement in your eyes and I made you go past it. But that's right, that's right. Let's finish off with the broth. Okay, yeah. So the last motorcycle in this exhibition, Early Landmarks in Automotive Engineering, is this 1929 Bruff Superior SS100. I know, a bike very close to your heart. Yeah, this was the first true superbike. Uh, George Bruff was a great showman, of P.T. Barnum type. <laughs> um, there's a lot of talk, which was the greatest British motorcycle, the Vincent or the Bruff? It, it tends to go to the Vincent because they built their own engine. What George Bruff does, he found the best engines he could, and then he had them blueprinted to make them a little bit better. Uh, the JAP, some people call it Jap, it, it's nothing, it's not a slight against Japanese, or it's not referring to Japanese motorcycle. I'll say something as a Jap engine, people go, hey, don't say that. No, no, that's, it means J.A. Presswick. Right. That's what it means. It's, it's not a racial slur of any kind. Uh, it also had the most beautiful gas tank in motorcycling. This, to me, I think is just the most beautiful gas tank you could you could get. Plus, this looks like a fast motorcycle. <laughs> I mean, I think it's one of the best looking bikes ever. Uh, George Bruff was a master at uh, almost detailing over technology. There was nothing particularly advanced about this bike. It just used the best components you could get. JAP 1000cc, overhead valves, Bentley and Draper suspension. Uh, these were really quite quick. Uh, you had a hand shift, which I love. I love mm -hmm. using the hand shift on these things. Uh, these got famous because Lawrence of Arabia had T. A. Lawrence. Lawrence. Mm -hmm. He had actually seven. He died. Uh, he never took delivery of the eighth one. He died uh, May 4th, 1934, I believe. And at the time, he was the most um, publicized person in the free world because Lowell Thomas had followed his exploits and did a, did a Broadway show about him, you know, fighting on in Saudi Arabia with the flowing robes and all that, which sort of embarrassed uh, T.E. Lawrence. He, he, <laughs> didn't, he, he was a, a quiet man. He was an intellectual. Uh, so he, he it, it's just odd. I mean, Winston Churchill came to his funeral. Everybody did because he was such a hero to the British people and to, uh, to the Arabs as well. He, Arabs didn't have many Western heroes. Mm -hmm. and he fought the Turks, you know, and led the charge. And I mean, it was a, quite a dashing story in the time. And, and then he he re-entered the Air Force under the name Shaw. He was just, he didn't want to be T. E. Lawrence anymore. Right, so the splashy yeah, yeah, and he celebrity. Spent, he spent about a year before they found. Oh, he's really T. E. Lawrence. And then the whole thing started all over again. So anyway, uh, George Bruff used him as publicity. Uh, the most famous anecdote about this was George Bruff invited the motorcycling press to come to see the bike. And he had all his men put in white robes, white uh, mechanics, uh -huh. yeah, with white gloves. And they would assemble and, and they were, oh my God. And a motorcycle magazine called it the Rolls Royce of motorcycles. Then Rolls Royce tried to sue Bruff for using that. He just said, I didn't say it. They said it. And they would always quote the motor it said Motorcyclist Magazine, whichever one it was. Uh, so it became known as the Rolls Royce of motorcycles. So it was, it was a triumph of salesmanship 
over engineering. And if you believe that history belongs to those who write, write it, it. Well, you, you mentioned something too, which I know is, is a, an important part of the story that you tell about craftsmanship and precision. Right. And the fact that George Bruff knew how to get the best components, combine them in the best way, right. which again is actually very much sort of a Rolls Royce model to, to do things at the highest level, regardless of, of what, the, what the origins were. That's right. And to um, also uh, the fact that, that this model happens to be called um, an Alpine uh, Grand Sport. Right. And uh, just like the Rolls Royce uh, Silver Ghost Alpine Eagles. Right. The idea of conquering mountains right. with a motor vehicle is a very big deal, especially with a 100 mile per hour motorcycle. Right, right. Yeah, now this, uh, th th this was, was quite a bike. You know, today we call it boutique engineering. Mm -hmm. I use Wilwood disc brakes, I use a Tremec transmission, I use a crate motor from General Motors, and the body designed by whoever. Mm -hmm. And that's, the, and that's th he was one of the, first people to do that. He got the best engine at the time, the JAP. Uh, he designed this gas tank, which I, like as I mentioned before, is the most beautiful. And he just knew the things that would catch the enthusiast's eye, the hand controls. These normally came with what they call Bonningson's phenometers. Hmm. And they were made by a clockmaker. And Bruff didn't like the fact that on a motorcycle, the needle always went like this, because the thing was like, right. so the Bonningson, it had two needles. And you go down the road, I have one, and you go down the road and you go tick, 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 five, and holds there. And then it goes tick, 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 seven. And it stays there, that's 57 miles an hour. And then it goes back to zero. And then it goes tick, 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 six, tick, 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 four, 64 miles an hour. It's so mesmerizing, you look, that! It's just so mesmerizing, looking, looking at the, you know, the, uh, the machination of this thing. I mean, it's pretty neat. I mean, you know, these were really legendary motorcycles. And I, as I said, George Bruff wrote glowing articles about his own product, and the English are a nation of scribes, so mm -hmm. all that material is collected. So this history on these, deserved or not, there are people who say it's not deserved. I think it is. I mean, they hold their value. Uh, I think a Bruff, with the exception of a Vincent Black Lightning one for a million dollars, uh, these are probably the most expensive motorcycles you could get. Uh, the one that George Bruff died on is was for sale for years for a million something pounds, you know. So there's so much history and so much tradition of these, and they're built in that old fashioned way. It's a classic style. It just looks like a motorcycle. The motor is really prominent. You've got all these, you know, the, 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 the cool mufflers here, the Brooklyn style mufflers, and uh, yeah, I just think it's one of the greatest bikes. And so much fun to, to drive because a ride because there's just all kinds of things to do. You have to pay attention because you have no brakes. <laughs> I mean, you can Always useful. You can retard progress, but you can't stop, really. Well, and speaking of progress, this brings us to the end of this motorcycle segment of our exhibition, Early Landmarks in Automotive Engineering. I think you've learned from our friend Jay why all of these motorcycles are here in this show, what they contributed to the advancement of motorcycles and to the motor vehicle in general, so that when you come back and visit us here at the Audrain Automobile Museum in Newport, Rhode Island, you'll be able to see this and the cars here as well. Thanks for joining us, and be sure to come back and watch our other videos. Thanks, Jay. Thanks.